our illustrious chair of curriculum and she will announce our speaker. Kathy. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to invite back Scott Moore, a professor at Eastern in history. And Scott has been one of the most popular speakers we've had in person. So we're glad he could join us online. Um, most of us remember, I'm sure all of us remember the fall of the Berlin Wall. And one of our members, Anne, if you could show us, actually has a piece of it. Could you hold that up, Anne? Okay. Um, we all also remember Ronald Reagan saying, tear down that wall, Mr. Gorbachev, or something of that sort. And um, it's very interesting to all of us, history being our favorite topic at CLEAR, to welcome back Dr. Scott Moore. Scott? Thank you for having me again. Um, and it's it's always great to participate with this group. I, I really enjoy it every time. And I was, as I said, uh, you know, when I first logged in, getting things set up, I was very sad um, that we had to postpone our, our talk from last year. Um, and this originally was was slated to be uh, uh, given last year um, when it would have aligned more closely with the 30th anniversary of the reunification of Germany. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's it's you know sort of a perennially interesting topic, um, and I think if, as we think about the end of the Cold War, there is no image more that stands out than the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Um, even though you know the Soviet Union lasted for about two more years, and almost nobody remembers the collapse of the Soviet Union sort of as dramatically and viscerally. Um, and I think that you know I think a few years ago you may have had a colleague of mine, David Fry, talk about walls. Um, and, you know, when I talked, when we were talking about his book on walls, um, you know, one of the things that he constantly sort of lamented was the only wall people care about is the Berlin Wall. Um, in other words, it's sort of iconic in, in sort of our imagination. Um, and so I'm going to start now by trying to share my, uh, my PowerPoint. So we'll see if that works out, if I can find where it is. So hopefully everybody can see that. If not, um, you can sort of interrupt me to let me know. Um, but as I said, um, you know, the, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall in many ways for most people continues to sort of summarize or, or embody uh, the end of the Cold War and the collapse of communism. Um, and I'm sure for those of you that, that have memories of the event, um, if we were to get in a time machine and sort of go to any of you or anybody paying attention in, let's say, 1988, and say, in one year, the Berlin Wall is going to collapse, and Germany will be reunified a year later, and all of it's going to happen peacefully without a single gunshot or military conflict. Nobody would have believed you. Um, and I think that one of the things that still stands out as, as historians now look at the end of the Cold War is trying to really grapple with how something that seems so permanent and, and sort of so static could then fall apart seemingly overnight. And everybody knew that, that the East German government and communist governments more broadly had problems. Um, everybody knew that their economies were growing increasingly unstable. Everybody knew that there was sort of a political restlessness uh, brewing. But the thing is that the communist states, especially backed up by Soviet military might, um, seemed utterly incapable of being overwhelmed because their military power and their willingness to use military power um, had had kept communism in line and stable uh, throughout the entire history of the Cold War. And so the goal for today's talk is to try to sort of give you an overview of those events and to try to sort of figure out how all of this was possible. How did something that seemed so permanent collapse so quickly um, and do so very peacefully? Um, and, you know, one thing I tell my students all the time when I talk about the Cold War is to remember that the Soviet Union had the second largest collection of nuclear weapons in the world. And if you consider, you know, if, if you think back to anything you know about history, think of all the empires and countries that willingly watch their empires and countries collapse without using force to maintain it. 
Um, and, you know, that can sort of tell again that it's almost miraculous that that some sort of major uh, uh, military confrontation didn't occur. Um, in many ways, especially for, for the European Cold War, the division of Germany is the defining sort of symbol of, of the Cold War. Uh, if we think of the Cold War, you know, with, with the Iron Curtain uh, analogy, um, in the case of the Berlin Wall and in the thousands of miles of border wall that separated East Germany from West Germany, you had a little literal curtain dividing the country in half. And the division of Germany was largely the byproduct of, of two twin events. The first will be the end of the Second World War, which saw the utter collapse of Nazi Germany, um, and the emerging Cold War, which grew out of the competition between the Soviet Union and the United States as their alliance broke down at the end of World War II. Um, the Allies had determined by the end of the war that all of the victorious Allies would occupy parts of Germany. Um, and this was seen as a way of, of in, ensuring that Germany would be rehabilitated and sort of made into a functional part of the world system after what it had done in World War II. Um, we don't know exactly what the long-term plans were, largely because they had never been made. Uh, but there were vague notions of the fact that some sort of German government would be made in the future, that Germany would be reunified uh, as, as it was, de as it was uh, demilitarized and unoccupied by the Allies, meaning there was never really a sort of expectation that Germany would be broken into two countries. These plans, however, really ran afoul of the increased competition in the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, both were eager to see the new Germany sort of crafted in their own image. The United States wanted it to be a parliamentary democracy, um, the Soviet Union a communist dictatorship. Um, as tensions between uh, uh, over what should happen in Germany began to ratchet up, essentially what happened is by 1949, West Germany or the Western zones uh, occupied by Britain, France and the United States were turned into a parliamentary democracy under Konrad Adenauer, who had been the mayor of the city of Cologne in the West. Once this was done, the Soviet Union put up their puppet preferred leader, Walter Ulbricht, um, who basically was given control over the Soviet occupied zone. Um, by, uh, by the end of 1949, two governments had been created, um, largely in the image of their occupying power. Walter Ulbricht had been a committed communist before World War II. He had fled to Moscow once the Nazis took over in the 1930s um, and spent the entire war in Moscow, meaning that he essentially was uh, uh, the, the Soviet Union sort of go-to guy who was part of a whole collection of East German communist leaders that were put into place to design and, and create the architecture of a communist state. Um, over the course of, the, of 1949 into 1950, uh, the dictatorship was secured as you had the, the democratic order of the East German zone um, gradually reduced. And this was achieved by essentially taking the one party that actually had the most votes, the Social Democrats, and forcing them to merge with the Communist Party that only had about maybe 15 to 17 percent of the votes. Um, this vote for uni unifying these two parties failed by 82%, meaning that 82% of the members of the Socialist Party voted to not join the Communists. Um, however, the Communist Party declared that an overwhelming mandate for unity uh, and with a little help from military support, um, essentially crafted a, a single party dictatorship under the theoretical guise of democratic order. Um, if we were to look, both Germanys continue to develop in the image of, of the former occupying power. Um, West Germany, by 1955, had uh, not only completed a miraculous transition into a parliamentary state, uh, but it had joined NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, um, and also was part of the burgeoning movement toward greater unification in Western Europe, which will eventually emerge into the European Union. East Germany, um, under Ulbricht's leadership, uh, essentially became a full-fledged communist dictatorship where you had uh, total uh, government control over the economy and economic concerns, as well as an iron-fisted grip over the government itself. Um, East Germany was an integral part of, of the Soviet Union's analog to, the, to NATO, which was called the Warsaw Pact. 
Um, it also was a vital partner to the economic uh, entity that bound all of the communist states together under the domination of the Soviet Union. Um, part of the reason for why this was so necessary is because East Germany, in spite of how devastated it was in the war, um, was still the most productive and industrialized uh, uh, member of the communist bloc besides the Soviet Union itself. And throughout the Cold War, it will remain the most productive economy of, of, uh, the, of the uh, communist bloc. Here you can see a map of what had been uh, West Ger the West German states. Um, here you can see uh, uh, East Germany. Um, I mentioned that East Germany actually was the highest functioning and, and most performative economy in, East, in, in the Eastern Bloc. Um, and if we were to look over time, the East German economy actually tended to improve over the course of the Cold War. Uh, it stagnated the way all the communist states did. But if you were to compare life, for example, in 1949, to let's say 1979, it is undeniable that, that the economy was much, much stronger. And one of the things that I think is challenging for us to understand is that um, East Germany was never competing against itself or even the other communist states. It was always competing against West Germany. Um, and in this sense, what I, what I would like to uh, sort of try to explain is that the sort of basic promise of communism as an ideology. Um, you know, nobody willingly ascribes to an ideology that says we're going to suppress your individual desires and take away all of your individual ability to pursue your life. Um, that wasn't what was promised. The basic promise of communism was that by pursuing government control of the economy and by allowing one party rule over the state, you would be able to provide a better life and a better standard of living than what capitalism and the former structures had provided. That was an easy promise to make in let's say the 1920s as the uh, capitalist economy seemed to lurch from crisis to crisis in Europe. But it was very hard after World War II when the West uh, underwent the so-called economic miracle and experienced this unprecedented consumer revival that produced the most functional and robust economies in global history. And so what this means is that East Germany was always competing against the promise of what the West had to offer. Um, and no matter what they did, there was no way they could match it simply because uh, the restrictive command and control structure of communist economic policy couldn't match the dynamism of, of what the West could offer. And nowhere was this clearer than in Berlin, which if you look at my map here, you'll notice Berlin like Germany itself, was divided into two halves. The Western half was occupied by the United States and the other Western allies. The Eastern half was occupied by the Soviet Union. Um, what this meant is that from 1950 onward, the shops and life in West Berlin experienced the same economic boom that West Germany did. East Germany can uh, uh, develop the same economic stagnation as, as, as the rest of the country. Meaning that you could literally, if you lived near the East and West divide, look out your window and see new department stores, new consumer goods, better streets, better uh, electric grids, better telephone wires and things like that, and then look at what you had, uh, meaning that you could visibly see the difference. The Soviets and the East Germans desperately tried to get the West out of West Berlin as a way of trying to, as a way of solidifying total control over, over East Germany, but also to avoid this dramatic difference. Um, in 1948-49, for example, Stalin attempted to force them out by blockading uh, with, with Soviet military uh, the, the railways and roads into West Berlin. Uh, this was evaded by the West essentially airlifting supplies into the area. Um, over the course of the 1950s uh, or 1960s, um, East Germans began voting with their feet. Uh, once it became clear how much better things were in the West, hundreds of thousands of East Germans began leaving every year, um, some of them under the, the, the auspices of sort of flying by night. Um, others began literally just walking across the street if they had uh, the ability to sort of get into West Berlin and then going to the West Berlin airport, hopping on a plane and flying to the West. Um, the ability to get between East and West Berlin was easier um, at, uh, before the construction of the Berlin Wall. Um, and if you were to look by 1961, 1.65 million East Germans had fled 
uh, from East Germany to West Germany. Um, this was not only an embarrassment to the promise of the workers' paradise, it also directly contradicted East German propaganda that life was better in the East as opposed to the capitalist West. But even more dire, uh, that those who tended to leave were those with marketable skills. And so it was a brain drain as well, as you had educators, scientists, researchers, um, those who had functional skills that could uh, be beneficial to the East German state. Ultimately, the, the fight over Berlin um, was resolved when the East German government, with the support of the Soviet Union, um, literally overnight began constructing a barrier between the eastern part of the city and the western part of the city. Um, this was a shock to everybody. Uh, it seemingly popped up overnight in August of 1961 um, and became more and more elaborate as time went on. The East German government, of course, could not admit that it was building this to literally keep its people in, um, which is why it was being constructed. And instead, it was announced to be an anti-fascist protection barrier um, to protect East Germany from the fascist government that controlled the West, uh, because in their logic, the fascists had been capitalists. Therefore, the capitalists who still existed were fascists, just like the Nazis. Um, and so uh, this obviously was a lie. Um, everybody knew it was a lie, by the way, but you just sort of acknowledged the lie because what are you going to do? You don't have the guns, the government does. Um, overnight, the, 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 the barrier between East and West Berlin became a fortified deadly zone. Anybody trying to cross would be shot. Um, there weren't warning shots. People were, the, the, the border guard shot to kill. Um, and over the course of 1961 until uh, the fall in 1989, um, dozens of people will die attempting to uh, break through the barrier, escape through the barrier. Um, I think the saddest story I ever get to tell about this from, a, from, an, uh, from sort of the perspective of history is the last casualty was actually two weeks before the wall and, uh, fell down um, as somebody tried to escape. And if you go to Berlin today, um, there have been efforts to try to preserve the markers that West Germans made um, to sort of mark where people had died along the, uh, the, the wall. And it's a, a sort of very harrowing, um, uh, uh, sort of depressing uh, reminder of that. Um, I think it's difficult, uh, and I, I want to sort of go a little bit on a, on a side note, um, to explain the, the sort of psychological impact of the Berlin Wall. Um, here you can see where the, the, the most visible spot of it uh, in front of the Brandenburg Gate. Um, this literally went through the heart of Berlin. This is about maybe a half a mile walk, not even that far, um, from the German Reichstag building, so the equivalent of the capital. Um, so imagine if Washington, D.C. were literally cut in half at the Washington Wall um, and turned into a fortified zone uh, that was sort of hollowed out with everything torn down. Um, but also the, the human cost is in many ways incalculable, uh, mainly because, you know, like most countries and cities, people had family that lived across the street and all of a sudden they were, were largely cut off. Um, and this says nothing from West Germans who couldn't see relatives in the East. And so uh, the sort of human tragedy of, of the Berlin Wall, I think, is, is one of its lasting legacies. Uh, because, of course, in the scope of history, uh, if you think about it, it was only up for 27 years, but then think in human terms of what 27 years means uh, to the life of a family or life of an individual. Um, and so, you know, ultimately what this is going to do is sort of harden um, that division between East Germany and West Germany. Um, ironically, the Berlin Wall for all of the human suffering uh, meant that Germany was no longer a flashpoint of the Cold War. All of a sudden, the competition over Germany was over because there was now literally a wall separating East and West Berlin. Um, and so ultimately, what this will do is almost ossify the division of Germany, making it seem almost permanent. Uh, because, of course, the only way anybody could imagine how this was going to end is if one of the sides dramatically attempted to break through that stalemate, which, of course, nobody wanted to risk given the cost of, of a nuclear war or military confrontation between the Soviet Union and the United States. And so this the, the Berlin Wall in many ways is not only a symbol of the division of Germany, but it helped to almost confirm the permanence of that division. However, the Berlin Wall, at its, at, in spite of this symbol, um, 
is almost an acknowledgement of the inherent challenges and weakness that the East German government had, which is simply that it could not provide freedom, certainly, but it also couldn't provide the prosperity the West did. Um, and East Germany cultivated a very sophisticated surveillance state pol and police state in order to try to control dissent and prevent dissent from, from boiling over and challenging their control over the state. Um, I think the most visible symbol of this, even though you're not supposed to see them, uh, was the Stasi, which was the East German secret police network. Um, the Stasi ended up becoming the most sophisticated surveillance and secret police force in the world. Um, it was entirely designed to spy on and report on East German citizens and to ferret out those who had uh, disloyalty or those who were, were seen as insufficiently loyal to the, uh, to the East German state. To give you an idea how sweeping the Stasi was, um, by 1989, they had nine or 97,000 employees, and they had over 173,000 full-time informants. Um, to give you a comparison, the Nazi Gestapo had one agent for every 2,000 citizens. The KGB had one agent for every 5,830 citizens. The Stasi had one agent for every 63 uh, citizens. If you add in part-time employees, that gets to one agent per every 6.5 citizens. What that meant is that when you lived in East Germany, it is legitimately possible that at least one or more members of any office you were in, classroom you were in, or store you were in, had an informant who was immediately going and reporting on uh, to a Stasi agent about who they saw there, who they saw people talking to. And then they compiled databases that would uh, uh, sort of uh, link up relationships and keep track of anybody that was found to be insufficiently loyal or to have red flags that might mark them as insufficiently loyal. This may mean, for example, if you had a grandmother that lived in West Germany, you may be more intensely surveilled by the Stasi because you were seen as having Western ties. Um, I read one uh, interview with a woman who had an Italian boyfriend and that sim and simply dating him for a month meant that she was surveilled by the Stasi for the rest of her life and blocked by having promotions and was essentially prevented from moving up within uh, uh, her, her uh, job simply because of the appearance of disloyalty. Um, when the Stasi was disbanded once Germany was reunified, um, it was discovered that they had collected so much information in the form of phone taps, video surveillance, and documents that it would take 41 employees over 375 years to read through every document the Stasi had collected. Um, if you go to the Stasi warehouses today, there's literally miles of documents uh, that are simply just listing where people went that day, who they talked to, uh, what their jobs were, who their friends were, who their families were. Ultimately, I think the Stasi reveals that the East German government deeply distrusted its own people and distrusted its own grip on power. Um, and this didn't change even when the East German government had a pivot in leadership in the 1970s, when Eric Honecker took over from Walter Ulbricht. Um, Honecker basically is a sort of paradox of a leader because he attempted to rectify the economic challenges by doubling down on consumer goods, consumer production, and improving standard of living. But he also doubled down on surveillance, rapidly expanding the scope of the Stasi. Um, and it is true that if you look over the 1970s, the economy did seem to be slowly improving. Um, somebody had mentioned at the start the terrible East German cars. Here you can see they are. Here they are. Um, you did have the increase of car manufacturing, television manufacturing, uh, refrigerators, other things that people associate with with sort of modern uh, uh, creature comforts. Um, however, two problems emerged. One is the quality was always terrible because there was only one source of all of them and it was the government and there was no competition and they were made quickly and cheaply. The other problem is there were never enough of them to satisfy demand. Um, for example, people would sometimes wait years to get a car, um, years to get a television, years to get an apartment that had uh, uh, better plumbing, better electricity, things like that. Um, even worse, showing the sort of corrupt nature of the, of the government, um, it tended to be given out based on who you knew in the government. So if you had friends within the, the sort of hierarchy of the communist system, you would get things first. 
uh, if you were seen as too Western leaning or too disloyal, you may not get anything at all. Um, one of the other ironies is that the growing prosperity of East Germany ironically revealed the, how unprosperous it was compared to the West. Um, and that was largely because of something called television. The more East Germans got television, the more aware they became of life in the West. And that's because, of course, and if you consider modern Germany is about the size of, of Michigan, cut Michigan in half, you can easily get television signals from one part of Michigan to the other. Um, and what would happen is everybody in East Germany knew the way to bend their antennas and their satellite dishes to get Western German television stations rather than East German television, because East German television was atrociously boring to watch because it was all communist propaganda. And so the East German government spent the entire 1970s talking about how the, the West was lying about their prosperity, how life was better in the East um, and the advantages of the East. And yet people were watching things, you know, think about what you watched in the 1970s and 80s. Um, you know, think about watching Dallas or Dynasty and the sort of life that that projected. And what East Germans would see is, well, OK, the West may be lying about everything, but that actress has changed clothes seven times in this one episode. And you would see the sort of things in people's apartments and houses and stuff like that. And it just uh, seemed to sort of expedite that uh, the, the, the frustration with the regime that was, was largely stagnant. One of the more structural problems East Germany had um, was that as it was committing to these uh, uh, consumer goods, it was having to sell them at a loss. And that's because one of the basic promises of communism is that you will be able to afford everything, that there is that price and that class and economic position will not prevent people from sharing in the full benefit of everything um, because it was a classless society, an economically equal society. So if television existed, everybody should be able to have a television. Of course, the problem is what they had to charge was, was much less than what televisions actually cost to produce. And that's because in, in order to ensure that everybody had everything and could afford everything, they kept prices artificially low. This was for TVs, cars, but also for food. And ultimately, by the 1970s, what began happening is the East German government began borrowing money hand over fist from West Germany, um, because West Germany by this point had began pursuing something called Ostpolitik, or Eastern policy. West Germany was desperate to try to uh, resolve tensions between the two Germanys, um, largely on humanitarian grounds. They wanted to figure out a way to help um, allow for greater connections between East and West to allow family members to visit each other, things like that. And one of the, the ways that Ostpolitik functioned um, was essentially West Germany began lending trillions of dollars a year to East Germany. Um, and ultimately what this will do is create this, this sort of sucking hole in the East German economy where they begin borrowing more and more and more money that they'll never be able to pay back. Ultimately, by the time you get to the 1980s, the middle of the 1980s, a perfect storm has been created where you have a political shift in the Soviet Union, which I'll talk about in a second. You have growing restiveness in the communist world in general, people beginning to sort of percolate uh, protests and things like that. And then also you begin to have Western financial markets questioning whether they're getting any of this money back. And so they begin sort of tightening the, 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 the spigot on the money that was flowing into the East, causing them to do unpopular things like rising, raise prices and stuff like that, which only further increased dissent. The, the major impetus for the uh, collapse of communism, however, will come from the Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. Um, Gorbachev was a true believer. He was a devout communist. Uh, he firmly believed in the superiority of communism as an ideology. He wanted to preserve and, and, and strengthen communism by addressing what he saw as its obvious failings and obvious problems. And so he didn't come to power to end communism. He tried to save it. This will be achieved uh, in, on every dimension imaginable. Um, he began an unprecedented series of negotiations with the United States aimed at limiting uh, nuclear expenditures and military expenditures. He recognized that uh, the Soviet military commitments were bankrupting it and that they had to figure out a way to, to diminish what they were spending each year on the military. Um, 
He also began a series of bold internal initiatives aimed at changing the Soviet economy, as well as opening its political system. So he began to experiment with the command and control aspect of the, of the economic system. But more importantly, he began to allow people to critique, uh, to expose corruption when they saw it. He began to allow near freedom of the press, pretty dramatic for the Soviet Union, not so dramatic for the West, um, where journalists could actually expose corruption or challenge the system. Even though he maintained communist control over the state, he did allow multiple candidates to run for office. So you had a choice of which communist you wanted. Um, all of these things were aimed at opening the system um, and creating a more humane, more responsive, more economically sound communist party. Um, more importantly for our talk, he also made clear that the Soviet Union would no longer use military support to keep communist governments in line. Over the course of the Cold War, whenever there were uprisings, rebellions, or things that challenged the communist governments of Eastern Europe, they could always rely on the fact the Soviet Union would send in tanks to crush it and reassert control. On financial grounds, Gorbachev made clear the Soviet Union was no longer going to bankroll that cost. And on humanitarian grounds, he began, he basically argued that it was not in the Soviet Union's humanitarian interest to essentially use force to keep people in line. What this meant is that the dictatorships of, of, of the communist world were in an awkward position where all of a sudden they could no longer rely on the Soviet Union to keep them afloat. In fact, Gorbachev spent four years telling these communist dictators, you should probably do your own version of Glasnost and Perestroika. You need to figure out a way to make this work. Um, Eric Honecker missed the memo and instead decided as dissent began ratcheting up toward the middle of the 80s, uh, he began ratcheting up the surveillance and, and suppression efforts to keep control over the state. Um, ultimately, this ended up becoming untenable, however. Um, the communist government of East Germany never faced the same level of threat as will occur in Poland or, or other East, East, Eastern European states. The problem it faced, though, is that it was tied to a communist world where those states were collapsing. Um, by 1989, the communist governments of Poland and Hungary had collapsed over the course of the summer, um, largely based on the, the strength of the dissent and frustration that began to emerge. The border between East Germany and West Germany was largely closed. However, you could easily travel between East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and the broader communist world. So if you were an East German, it was pretty much expected that you could use your, your relatively stronger economic might to go on vacation, for example, in the nice lake country of Hungary, which hundreds of thousands of East Germans did every year. In 1989, this became a problem for East Germany, however, because Hungary, as I said, saw its communist government collapse, and the Hungarian government also opened its border with Austria, which was a Western-aligned uh, state. What this meant is that the first sort of hole in the Iron Curtain emerged. People could easily walk back and forth uh, 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 more easily than they had been able to. Um, even more dire for, uh, uh, for East Germany, the Hungarian government began distributing pamphlets announcing this open border to all of the East Germans who were busy camping out there in uh, 1989. And so there's a very curious event that occurs in August of 1989 that sort of shows how dramatic this opened. Um, for those of you that know European history very well, there's a name I'm about to give that should sound a little familiar, um, and that is Otto von Habsburg. Um, you shouldn't know who he is, but his family, the Habsburgs, uh, ruled Central Europe for about 700 years, um, meaning that if World War I hadn't occurred, he would have been the emperor of the Austrian Empire which governed Austria, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, as well as parts of Romania, Bosnia, et cetera. Um, he was a noted humanitarian. He was a noted uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, force trying to work for better relationships between East and West. Um, and as the Cold War began sort of shaking in 1989, he worked with Hungarian leaders to create what he called a pan-European picnic. This was near the Hungarian city of Sopron, which is about maybe 10 miles from the Austrian border. Um, and the goal was to sort of show this renewed goodwill between East and West by having Austrians and Hungarians come 
and essentially enjoying picnic with one, with one another in an afternoon. Crashing the party, however, were literally hundreds of East Germans who were hoping they could sneak across the border when it was opened. Um, and what this will mean is that uh, that day, as well as the days afterward, um, you ended up having a situation where hundreds and then eventually thousands of East Germans began uh, pouring from Hungary and Austria. The Hungarian government was certainly not going to shoot East Germans who were walking across the border. Um, and as I, as I you know, like to sort of point out at this point, if you try to understand why more force wasn't used, um, the governments were very unwilling to sort of be the person that made the call stop people from crossing the border, which meant that it came down to the division commander to be the person to say, stop people from crossing the border. Nobody wanted to be that person which meant it fell to the 18-year-old conscript who was the border guard with the machine gun that had to decide to stop people from crossing the border. And ultimately, nobody was willing to be the person that was shooting refugees as they were fleeing across the border um, because nobody knew whether or not the government would ultimately support them. Um, and so what you'll see is that over the course of the summer, uh, especially as Czechoslovakia's uh, communist government collapsed, um, is that of thousands of East Germans were flooding embassies in Warsaw and Prague, but also going to Hungary and driving across the border, moving into the east or moving into the west. Um, by the fall, there was a joke that Germany was going to reunify simply because everybody was going to leave East Germany and move to the west. This joke became increasingly dire, however, um, because all of a sudden the West German government had a full-fledged refugee crisis as it had to figure out how to house um, and take, take care of hundreds of thousands of people that were coming across the border, largely without anywhere to stay, without any money, um, and to figure out how to incorporate these individuals in, uh, into, into their state. It also totally shattered the legitimacy of the East German government as this refugee crisis was happening. Um, as historical ironies and awkwardness would occur, um, all of this was happening at the 40th anniversary of the East German government, um, and Eric Honecker, really refusing to see the, the flow of history, was bound and determined to put on a, a strong military parade and sort of celebration that would show the vigor and strength of East Germany as it was literally collapsing. While this was happening, protests began breaking out first in the city of Leipzig, the second largest city in East Germany, uh, but soon began occurring in major cities across uh, East Germany. Uh, these protests were entirely peaceful, however, they were massive, and they occurred every Monday like clockwork. Again, the East German government was in this awkward position of what do you do with these protests? They're not doing anything violent. Um, and so they, they were hesitant to use explicit force, especially since Gorbachev and the Soviets made clear they would not back that, that use of force. And so they were largely stuck in this, in this uh, awkward position. Um, one of the chants that emerged as the slogan of these protests was, we are the people, um, meaning that the, the, the people of Leipzig and the people of these protests were telling their government or were demanding that the government be more responsive and reactive to their needs as the people, as the source of legitimacy for their state. Um, I mentioned that slogan because it's going to get a little tweak in a second. Um, Gorbachev made clear his frustration with what was going on in East Germany when he came to this grand military celebration that Eric Honecker uh, had put on. Um, and I think that every now and then foot photographers managed to un unintentionally capture the truth of history. Uh, and I think that nothing reveals uh, Gorbachev's attitude toward East Germany more than this accidental photo of him checking his watch during the military parade, almost as if to, to tell Eric Honecker that time is up. Um, during this meeting, er, uh, Gorbachev made clear that the East German government needed to reform or it was going to collapse and that the Soviet Union would be providing no support. Um, Honecker's days were numbered anyway. Uh, he had been battling cancer for a while. Um, and more importantly, as his grip on power was weakening, there was an internal palace coup that replaced him with his deputy, Egon Krenz. Um, Krenz's role was to initiate a last-ditch effort at reform to salvage the regime. However, these reforms were too little, too late, and very much uh, uh, did nothing to address the demands of the hundreds of thousands of people that were turning out every day uh, to protest. 
as this situation became more and more challenging, um, here you can see one of the protests in early November. Um, one of the, again, history turns on, in many cases, accidental events. Um, and what happened on November 9th to initiate the, the final collapse or, or the, the beginning of the end of the East German government um, was an accidental mistake made at a press conference. One of the most awkward elements of the collapse of communism was when communist regimes were attempting to look like they were doing what Western states did by interacting with the press, had press conferences and things like that. Um, go on YouTube if you ever want to spend an hour or two wasting time and look at how painfully awkward it is to see these people who had been so used to essentially just dictating what they wanted to have happen, trying to answer questions from journalists who are not sort of kept in line by threat of force. And so on November 9th, um, a spokesperson for the East German government named Gunter Sabowski um, came out to give a press conference. He was handed a sheet of paper on his way out. He had not really been briefed on the discussions. Um, and essentially, the, in order to try to turn down the, the temperature, in order to try to block the hundreds of thousands of people trying to move from east to west, um, the East German government put out a very carefully worded statement that said they are beginning the process of figuring out how to open the border between east and west. In other words, they're figuring out how you sort of create a orderly flow where you, you know, just like if you want to go to Canada, can go to a, a passport check. Um, he had no idea what the document said and was sort of mumbling and reading it over to the journalists. And then a journalist said, well, when does the border open? And he sort of awkwardly looks at his paper, has no idea what he says. He goes, now. And everybody just sort of stopped because here you had the East German government literally just say they were going to allow people to move from east to west. Um, that's not what was supposed to happen, but all of a sudden now everybody began rushing the border. Um, if you look at the Berlin Wall, people began going to the checkpoints and the border guards were awkwardly standing there with guns they had literally been using two weeks earlier to shoot people trying to cross. But you had so many people there and all of them were saying, we heard on the television we're allowed to leave. They weren't really getting feedback from their superiors. The superiors weren't getting feedback from Krenz's government. Um, and so again, you're leaving it up to an 18 year old with a machine gun to try to figure out whether he wants to enforce a policy that had been in effect this entire time. And so they just stepped aside. Um, initially, they tried to control the passports and stamp them and stuff, but eventually they got swamped and overwhelmed, so they just let everybody through. And these, uh, this is where the images we have of the end of the, of the uh, Berlin Wall sort of come from, because by that evening, people were climbing the wall, um, drinking on the wall, celebrating, people began tearing it down. The morning of November 10th, however, uh, brought a little bit of, of sort of shakiness because, of course, nobody knew what would happen next. Um, nobody knew would the East government reassert control over the border? Would it be refortified? Would clear directions be put through? And so the celebration of November 9th turned into a degree of panic over the next few days as literally, again, thousands of people began rushing the East German border because they wanted to get through before it was closed again. And what this is going to do is create a crisis for the Krenz government because they had to figure out how do you stabilize the situation and legitimize the situation. It's worth pointing out West Germany had no interest in East Germany collapsing either because it certainly wasn't in the position of figuring out how to stabilize a, a East German state that no longer existed. Um, in fact, the, the West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl uh, said that he assumed that it would take decades to reunify Germany and he said this in 1989. Keep in mind, a month later, he's going to be working to be the person to reunify it. Um, the East German government uh, collapsed. It opened and announced the, the allowance of multi-party elections. Um, and this was done under the last communist leader, Gre uh, Gregor Geisi, um, who tried to rehabilitate the image of the Communist Party and run for office, um, like many of, of his compatriots did in other states. To the surprise of no one, however, uh, the first open and free elections uh, put in the part and put in power the center right Christian Democrats who had controlled West Germany under the Chancellor Helmut Kohl. Um, Helmut Kohl very much sort of saw the potential of history at this point. Um, he realized that he could work with the new leaders of the Christian Democratic Party in West Germany 
um, to begin greater uh, uh, cooperation between East and West, and that seeds could be laid to allow for, for greater cooperation, eventual unification. Um, on, uh, and so, it's, and here you can see some uh, uh, posters uh, for that union between East and West Germany's uh, Christian Democratic parties. In order to stabilize the East German government, um, the two Germanys agreed that East Germany would adopt the West German currency, which was stronger, more robust. Um, this was hope, uh, the hope was this would stabilize the deterioration of the East German government. Um, however, that didn't happen. Ultimately, uh, uh, what you will see is that the economic impetus uh, for, for unification will end up pushing it toward political unification, mainly because even though the border was permanently open, the economy of, what, of East Germany was collapsing almost overnight, meaning more and more people were still pouring into the West. In the end, the realization was that the only step forward would be full political unification if you wanted to have stability between East and West. In this time, protest continued, uh, pushing not just for the freedom to achieve, but for unification. If you think back about five minutes, I said that one of the Leipzig uh, protests standard slogans was, we are the people. Here you can see um, at the last demonstration in Leipzig, a woman who has a sign that says, even after our last demonstration, we are the people, we are one people. Um, meaning that there was a, a sort of in, a realization that if communism is no longer, and capitalism are no longer separating the Germanys, what is? Why are there two Germanys if it's not for this political division of the Cold War? Um, in the end, the way Germany unified is fairly anticlimactic. Rather than having some sort of grand constitutional convention, um, West Germany essentially annexed East Germany. That was seen as the easiest and fastest way to stabilize the, 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 the relationship between the two. Um, this has led some critics in East Germany to basically say that they got the short end of the stick because they were essentially folded in uh, to a political system that already existed. But it did produce a stable, uh, functional government relatively quickly. Um, the bigger challenge, however, was the fact that Germany couldn't just unilaterally reunify. It's worth pointing out that, remember, Germany was occupied at the end of World War II. The two Germanys were a byproduct of that occupation. Berlin was still technically occupied by the Soviet Union and, and uh, the Americans. Um, to help the Soviets agree to move out of East Berlin, uh, Helmut Kohl paid 55 billion Deutschmarks to pay for the uh, military expenses of moving the, the Russians out. Um, that helped the, boost the, the Soviet Scott, uh, I've lost your contact. Uh, to try. Oh. Am I back? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I'll pick up about 30 seconds ago. Sorry, I'm not sure what happened. Um, as I was saying, uh, the, in order for Germany to unify, it needed the permission of the four occupying powers. Um, the Soviet Union was always going to be one of the biggest people to try to sell this because, after all, they're the ones that lost their, their satellite in eastern, eastern uh, Germany. Um, but also, the Western allies were not particularly keen on this either. Uh, we know, for example, the British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, was deeply, deeply skeptical of a unified Germany uh, having the amount of industrial and economic power that it would. Um, she still sort of had the lingering lessons of, of, the, of the Second World War. Similarly, the French president, Francois Mitterrand, um, usually voiced his displeasure by saying that he likes Germany so much he hopes there's always two of them. Um, in the end, it largely fell to the American president, George H.W. Bush, to smooth over relationships with Britain and France while also getting the, uh, the Soviets on board. Um, the Soviet Union was very fearful of a united Germany being part of NATO, um, and so Gorbachev desperately tried to uh, push through a, a situation where Germany would be a neutral country free of NATO influence. However, by 1990, 1991, um, Gorbachev was rapidly losing any sort of actual political capital to push that through. 
And so what this means is that in Moscow in 1990, um, you had the signing of the two plus four treaty when the four allies, as well as the two Germanys agreed to accept this. Uh, to wrap up quickly and, and sort of a final five minutes, um, the reunification of Germany had been achieved and now the work of reunifying Germany had to happen. Um, it was much harder than anybody expected to get the two Germanys back together. Uh, Helmut Kohl, for example, dramatically underestimated how much investment it would take to modernize the sewage, electricity, telephone wires, infrastructure of East Germany. It took billions more Deutschmarks than he ever anticipated. On a cultural level and on a more profound level, um, East Germans who were frustrated with the system they had were now frustrated with the fact that they were competing on an open wage market where they could be fired if they weren't good at their job, were paid wages that were much lower than they expected, um, and could no longer uh, uh, have guaranteed access to employment, housing, and things like that. You also had a situation where in order to, to sort of take advantage of the new environment, many West Germans began moving to the East as almost venture capitalists, investing in real estate, investing in companies to try to, to benefit from uh, the potential of an, of an economic boom. This creates what, what many Germans called the wall in the mind as you started to have uh, uh, sort of stereotypes about Ossis and Vessis, Easterners and Westerners develop. Um, and here you can see sort of a, a cartoon that the, East, the Ossis were seen as lazy, naive, and self-pitying, uh, the vices is arrogant, egotistical, and ruthless. Um, I would like to say that there was a some sort of kumbaya moment that helped make this fix uh, fix itself. However, I think really what made it fix itself was the fact that time has gone by. Um, if you're in Germany today, anybody under 30 literally never lived in a divided Germany, meaning that it helped to sort of create uh, uh, that end to that division, um, though you can still see clear cultural differences between East and West. One of the earliest questions of the renewed Germany is where the capital is going to be. Um, and ultimately it was decided to move it back to Berlin. And in this way, I think Berlin has become a symbol of the modern Germany. Um, with the wall gone, you now had literally an opening of vast amounts of, of downtown space that the German government has used to sort of create an image of what the new Germany is but you also have new businesses, new corporations, new uh, housing, things like that. Um, I remember the first time I went to Berlin in 1999, seeing in downtown uh, Berlin, 25 massive construction cranes surrounding me. Um, the symbols of the new Germany, I think, are, are sort of tied to the old. Uh, they, uh, there was a rehabilitation of the original Reichstag building to be the new seat of the German parliament. Um, and so it was given sort of a modern facelift. The decision was made to replace its historic uh, cupola with this glass dome, which you can, if you go in it, you can literally see directly into the halls of the, of the parliament. And that's in order to symbolize openness of parliamentary democracy after Germany had two successive dictatorships. Um, more government buildings tend to be more modern. Here you can see the new federal chancery that was opened. This has created a degree of, of sort of, again, backlash between East and West as, as Berlin has begun tearing down some of the symbols of East Germany. Uh, for example, there was on the house, on the grounds of the old Imperial Palace in, in Berlin, uh, constructed the People's Palace, which was essentially the Soviet Parliament building. This building was corroded and falling apart by 1990. And so the decision was made to tear it down. And if you go to downtown Berlin today, they're literally rebuilding the Imperial Palace the Soviets tore down. Um, and it's going to be a museum. But this has created a, a sort of impression uh, that there's a, a desire to sort of erase East Germany from Germany's history. Um, here you can see the, uh, that, that sort of construction center is the palace that has been torn down. Um, there also have been efforts for the new Germany to remember what allowed for this division to happen in the first place. Um, you can see a Jewish museum opened in 2004. If you go next to the uh, uh, Brandenburg Gate, um, which again is about half a mile from the, from the Reichstag building, there is a very haunting memorial built for the victims of the Holocaust. It essentially takes up an entire city block, and it's just various forms of granite, uh, uh, almost uh, sarcophagi and, and uh, uh, tombstones. 
And so you walk through this sort of maze of, of the symbols of death. Um, imagine, for example, if on the Washington Mall, there was a block size reminder of either the uh, genocide of the Native Americans or of, of the victims of slavery. And you get a sense of sort of that effort to try to confront um, uh, German history in a way that will allow the United Germany to, to avoid the mistakes of its past. Um, Germany's future is, I think, sort of strong. Uh, it's become a, a, a devoted part of the European Union. It's one of the most stable and prosperous members of it. Um, yet at the same time, there are still challenges that, that, that have, part, have popped up. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's sort of remarkable the extent to which the Germany today um, has been able to overcome that division. Uh, so that ends my talk. I thank you for your kind attention. I'm sorry for my one technical glitch. Um, and I look forward to uh, the questions you have. Well, well, thank you so much, Scott. Um, very informative. I, I actually thought I, I remember the fall of the Berlin Wall and I thought I knew a lot about it, but obviously I didn't. So thank you so much. Well, we'll now open it up to questions. You could either go to the chat and just say question and I'll try to recognize you or hold down your space bar ask a question and then let it go. Uh, so I'm gonna start off with one question, Scott. Um, it goes back to the very beginning of your talk okay. where, where the whole thing started in the Soviets, you know, they kind of parsed up West Germany and, and East Germany. Why did, why did... Oh, sorry, you cut out a little. Why, why did the Soviets even have the power to do that? Um, so the the actual uh, decision to divide Germany um, was made in the in, the, in 1944 um, when all four allies, uh, the French sort of snuck their way in. Um, but the decision was made to that everybody would occupy part of it. Um, and that's because nobody really knew what to do with Germany. Um, you know, the question in 1944 is, what do you do with a state that has done what the Nazis did? Um, how do you rehabilitate a state that has done what the Nazis did? Everybody knew you couldn't just let the Nazis stay in charge. But of course, you had to have a government. And so the question was, what do you do with Germany uh, uh, when you get rid of the Nazis, but before something else pops up? And so the decision was made that the four allies would temporarily occupy parts of Germany. And so everybody was sort of given their zone. Um, this also helped to avoid the thorny question of reparations, which if you know your World War I history is one of the big issues of Germany afterward, um, where all of the allies were decided they could take reparations from whatever part they had. So in the case of the Soviets, they literally dismantled factories from the East and moved them to the Soviet Union. Um, and so the answer wasn't so much that the, the Soviets decided to do it, it was just part of the agreement. Um, what nobody anticipated happening was that the relationship between the East and West would deteriorate literally within months of the world of, of the war ending to where uh, it would be um, non-functional. Um, because theoretically, the idea was that eventually they would figure out what it was supposed to be like. Um, and I think the, the best sort of parallel to what it should have looked like is what happened to Austria. Um, Austria, which is immediately to Germany's south, was also occupied by all four states. Um, and yet in 1955, all four of them left when they were agreed on what sort of government Austria would have and sort of its status in Europe. Um, Germany, however, was too important. It was too economically strong. It was too industrially strong um, that it, it, there was no way that they could figure out a, a sort of solution that would make both sides happy. Um, and to be honest, the United States is the one that actually jumped the gun. Um, they got frustrated waiting for the Soviets to, to sort of negotiate with them. So they just unified the three Western halves and created a, a state. And the Soviet Union said, well, I guess now that West Germany exists, we might as well create an East German state. Um, it all happened sort of in, 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 in sort of the, the chaos of the moment. But nevertheless, we did technically uh, uh, sort of start that process. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? I'll ask another one then. 
Okay, this is Anne, if I could just ask, because Scott had talked at the beginning about illiberal democracy, which seems to be springing up. Can you explain that concept again? So it's not exactly a sort of clear concept. Um, and in fact, I think it's a fair question. At what point does illiberal democracy just become a dictatorship with a fancy name? Um, you know, in this sense, I think of Vladimir Putin will allege he, he oversees a managed democracy. Uh, that's his preferred word for the Russian government. Um, but the, the political science work that I've seen um, on, on the concept of, of illiberal democracy, first it's based on the idea of liberal democracy, uh, which is, is sort of what uh, Western Europe and the United States um, have always sort of advanced as, as their form of government. And that is that you have representative structures. We vote for representatives, we vote for president, um, but you also have a commitment to liberal principles, freedom of speech, um, and I mean lowercase liberal. Uh, uh, so freedom of speech, freedom of religion, um, freedom of discourse, a commitment to uh, you know, basic human value and human rights. Um, what has begun to happen, and it's largely a sort of backlash to, in many ways, the creation of the European Union. Um, the European Union has not only economic influence over the Eurozone, but also it, it, it reserves the right to essentially secure liberal principles throughout all of its members. Meaning that if you feel as if your human rights have been violated or a state is operating in a way it shouldn't, you technically can sue in a European court and they have authority to, to interfere with the decisions of, their, of the member states. Um, you also have an entire group of bureaucrats that are in charge of making decisions and policies that, that affect the member states that nobody has any control over. Um, an analog would be, for example, in the United States, we have the Supreme Court, for example, that has led really the, led the advance of civil rights over the last 50 years. If you think about it, desegregation first started in the courts. Um, Roe versus Wade was, was uh, decided in the courts first. Um, if you think about gay marriage in 2015, that was decided in the courts. And the, the theory of, of illiberal democracy is, first off, I don't think anybody would call themselves that. It's, it's sort of a political science term. But if you look at, at right-wing populists, a sort of undercurrent of their logic is your democratic rights are being subverted by unelected bureaucrats or judges. Who have, who, have, who have determined in their own mind the way your society should look. And they are implementing policies you can't reverse. And so the argument is that, that the democracy they're pushing is actually a fuller expression of people's rights. The best example of this I think I could give would be from Hungary, which is in many ways the most illiberal democracy of, of Europe right now, um, where the Hungarian strongman, Viktor Orban, um, has really built sort of a name for himself saying that unelected professors, European Union bureaucrats, journalists are advancing that we should be accepting migrants from, uh, from the Middle East, um, that we should be pursuing policies uh, toward greater recognition of, of LGBTQ rights, um, all of which go against the will of our people, and I am defending your rights. I am the, I am the voice of the true people, and we're just going to ignore all of those people. Um, of course, the question comes, what does, what, how does democracy maintain itself if you don't have a commitment to freedom of speech, basic uh, human rights and values and things like that? And that's where you can easily slide into essentially one party or order dictatorship. Um, but of course, the contrast of that, and some political scientists have argued this, is what you could call uh, liberal undemocracy. Um, you know, what do you have, for example, when um, you know, to go back to the United States in the 1950s, when overwhelmingly Southerners would never have voted for desegregation. Um, and so technically having a court intervene violates democratic order because you're depriving the rights of people to decide the structure of, of how their society should be, but you're doing it in pursuit of what you see as noble goals um, and fulfillment of more basic principles. And so, um, and so that's not to say that that the two are equivalent by any means. Um, but if you look, you know, there there is there has been a tendency, uh, particularly on, uh, as as social movements have progressed, 
to rely on the more undemocratic elements of society to push it through because it's often easier to achieve necessary human right gains, um, you know, to convince a judge or a bureaucratic order um, rather than to try to win over people who are steadfastly opposed to it. Um, but nevertheless, I think it, it creates that tension that you're seeing. Any other questions? Uh, hit the space bar and hold it. Yeah, hi, Scott. This is Charles Warnock. And um, I had the opportunity on business to go to uh, Berlin in the very late 80s, uh, literally about a year before the wall fell. And I, I had some free time, so I actually took a tour around West Berlin, and then it deviated into the east for a few blocks to uh, around the high points of gates and things like that, and then came right back out. And it was it was amazing to see that contrast as we crossed through those checkpoints. Uh, we went through Checkpoint Charlie, for example. Mm -hmm. But the most interesting thing was uh, my conversations with my business colleagues who were in the, the west part of Berlin, and their attitudes were pretty much as you depicted them, that they kind of felt something was going to happen but they were very uncertain as to what the outcome was going to be. And I thought that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and it's, it's, I would imagine it was not a comfortable time to be in Berlin at that time, because, you know, again, we sort of have this, this, we know how it all played out. And so it seems, well, how could it have played out differently? But, you know, again, if you're, if you're there November 10th, nobody thought, that or nobody knew whether or not the East Germans would all of a sudden send a bunch of tanks and soldiers to the border um, and or would they try to sort of ferret out people. In fact, a bunch of people actually thought the announcement of the opening of the border was a trick by the Stasi to try to ferret out people who were disloyal to the state. And so people didn't want to go to the border because they thought they'd end up on some sort of list and detained or arrested by the Stasi. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, the one ironic thing is, given our, our sort of image of East and West, is if you go to Berlin today, East Berlin is much nicer than West Berlin because it's almost entirely new, um, because they've they've sort of built new buildings and new things, and it's where all the nice museums are and nice opera houses and things like that, all of which have been rehabilitated. And you know, by contrast, uh, West Berlin um, can be a little scuzzy because of just sort of the the sort of very open attitude of the Germans, especially when it comes to things like graffiti. Um, and so like, you know, West Berlin is just sort of covered with graffiti because of sort of their commitment to openness, um, which can sometimes borderline on disorder. But anyway. Hey, hey Scott, I, I have one other question. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, East German Stasi or had collected all kinds of documents on people and it sounded like they were still stored. Why is that? <laughs> um, so theoretically, um, well, first off, it's for the historic value. Um, in other words, it's, you know, historians, it's a vital tool for historians. Um, there have also been some talks, and I mean, this is one of the more awkward legacies of the collapse of East Germany, of how do you hold accountable what the Stasi did to people? Um, and the, the thought was that these records could be used as a way of holding agents accountable to how they behaved um, and for, for what the Stasi did. Um, very quickly, however, they decided that it was in the interest of a sort of forgetting to sort of give people a free pass, except for the most egregious abuses. Um, and so to the frustration of some people who were terrorized by the Stasi, um, agents were sort of allowed to live out the rest of their lives uh, uh, in sort of anonymity, uh, uh, getting away with, with what they had done. Um, but, you know, but you do have sort of a team of researchers that are going through this these miles of records um, where, you know, I, I, it's hard for us, I think, to even fathom the scope of the Stasi um, and the sort of mundane, bizarre things that they were very fixated on, um, because really their goal was to try to figure out anybody who is potentially westward leaning. Um, and so, you know, as I tell my students when I'm in the class of, let's say, 35, that, you know, and this is not an exaggeration, if we were in East Germany, I would have been a Stasi agent and three of them would have been a Stasi agent. And so we would have all then left our class and reported immediately to the Stasi agent we report to as to what everybody did. And then what they would do is compare notes and sort of see how it had. Um, but if you ask yourself, how do you keep control in a dictatorship that nobody supports? That meant nobody talked to anybody about anything. 
because everybody knew anybody they talked to could then immediately report on them to the Stasi. And so you didn't complain about the state. You didn't sort of acknowledge uh, any sort of resistance effort you had um, because nobody knew who was going to be listening or reporting. Okay, anybody else have a question in it? Again, if you're on the phone, star six unmutes you. I have one more then. Uh, this could be actually subject for a, another class, uh, which I would look forward to. But at the same time, the Berlin Wall came down, the Soviet Union collapsed, but then Putin arrived in they, uh, at least the, the whole union didn't come back together, but Russia sure did. Maybe you could explain how that happened. That would be a good talk for, or a good talk to give um, because it's, it's sort of a fascinating look at the failure of democracy. Um, and I think, you know, Putin sort of emerged because of, of the failure of Russia to emerge as a successful economic system um, afterwards. Uh, one of the things I should have mentioned as a historical uh, uh, sort of quirk is that during all these protests, Vladimir Putin was stationed in Dresden as a KGB agent. And so there's a very, very famous story where hundreds of protesters were storming the local Stasi building um, because as East Germany was collapsing, everybody wanted to go to the Stasi to either burn the records because they wanted to sort of end their surveillance or terrorize the agents. Um, and Putin was, was largely stationed in his KGB office by himself. Um, they didn't really have guards. And all of a sudden, there was fear that these hundreds of protesters would then storm the KGB building and do the same thing. Um, and there's a very, very famous anecdote of, of Putin walking downstairs, acting like he had a gun on him, threatening to, you know, that he would he didn't want to see this get ugly. Um, and that was enough to sort of intimidate the protesters away, even though he was totally unarmed and had no support. Um, but anyway. Uh, but largely, Putin's uh, sort of strongman act, I think, came from two things. Uh, the first was the sort of hopeless, dysfunctional corruption of the Yeltsin years, um, where the economy just seemed totally incapable of helping out anybody who would, had not managed to make themselves rich. Um, you also had runaway uh, uh, organized crime and, and sort of other problems. Um, inflation was rampant. Um, Coupled with this was also this sense that Russia had not only lost its status as a superpower, but that the, the West was not respecting Russia, that it was being looked down on, that it was being patronized to. And so Putin largely came to power promising to fix the economy, root out corruption, ironically given the level of corruption that he implemented, uh, but then also that he would restore respect to Russia, that he would reassert Russia's position in the world um, and if you look at, at how Putin has kept control, it has really been this sort of naked appeal to Russian nationalism and patriotism. Um, and, and when you talk to Russians, what's interesting is a lot of them will say, but at least Russia is respected again. Um, you know, at least Russia doesn't get kicked around anymore. Um, and I think that that sort of helps th uh, maintain the status. I think the bigger interesting question will be what happens to Russia after Putin. Um, because he can't be around forever. Um, and, you know, Russian history sort of moves in this weird cycle where you have a few decades of a strong man that then get followed by a decade of catastrophe and disorder. Um, and so I don't think we will see a sort of smooth transition to another leader as, as impactful as, as, as Putin for a while. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh... All right. Well, Thank you so much, Scott. Um, this has been very informative and, and very helpful, and uh, we thank you for participating. And I also thank everyone else for participating, and and uh, we'll we'll give you a, a hand. Great, I appreciated this. Thanks so much, everybody. We do have a topic that hopefully Kathy noted for next next time we have you back. Right.